Hello to everyone watching and listening around the world and welcome. Um, my name is Petra. I'm the marketing and course administrator here at IMA. And today I'm delighted to be joined by our amazing consultants and knowledge management training facilitators, um, Sylvia Capitulli and Ruth Jolly. Hello Ruth and Sylvia, welcome and thank you for joining me today. Hi Petra, good to be joining you. Yeah, hi Petra. Thank you. So let's start with a relatively easy first question. Um, so what are the three things that inspire you every day, um, Ruth? Well, I had the chance to think about this beforehand because you kindly gave us a little prompt. And I was thinking the three things that really inspire me. The first is being around the hedgerows, the hills, the woodlands near where I live. I really, really enjoy that. And that is a daily walk that I do. And on those walks, I'm really inspired to think about the invisible connections between animals, between different species, between plants, between all those things. And, and I'm more drawn to them in walking my dog, who's the second thing that inspires me, our dog, I should say, who is full of valor, mischief, quite a character. And he allows me to see some of those things that I don't think in our normal, my normal human life, I, I normally notice. So that's an inspiration. The third one, uh, is shared by millions around the world. David Bowie. He inspires me. Not every day, I don't dream of him every day, but his influence on me and being inspired by creativity and also his, I think what we know of his life, he's very witty, very generous, very inclusive and accepting. And um, everyone had just such good things to say about him. And I think his legacy and what he's done for um, improvising and artistry is amazing. So he also continues to inspire me. Mm -hmm. mm, nice, nice. Okay, so for me, it also starts with nature actually. My first um, thing that inspires me is walking by the sea. I live by the sea. I'm really lucky to live by the sea in Brighton here. And whatever the weather, whatever the season, walking by the sea really inspires me. It just It's the sense of open space. It's the, the differences and the energy. So that's for me like a real, a real big inspiration. Um, and the second one, I was thinking about these questions earlier, is actually um, my daughter, actually, my, my 23 year old daughter and what she's achieved in her life, in her young life, because she's only 23 and what she's been able to do and, you know, the challenges she's faced, but also what she's been able to, um, yeah, really achieve is the word, conquer and manage to, and, and how she's leading her life. And I find that in, quite incredible as a, and I find it really inspiring, actually, really. Um, and then I was a bit torn by the third one, whether it would be David Attenborough or, because uh, <laughs> I, I do love, I do love him. Um, and, um, but in fact, then I was thinking, actually, my son, my teenage son is an inspiration. The bit that inspires me is the way that he's looking after his health as a teenager and the way that he's actually, yeah, focusing on really, yeah, being healthy, which I find really inspiring because as a young generation that's really important yeah yeah thank you I agree with all of these like with the nature with family um and all of the energy which one can um gather from all of these inspiring stories um and inspirational people or animal or or the nature itself um so let me move on to the next question um yeah, so how um, did your love of knowledge management come about and why is it such an important topic for you? Um, Sylvia, if you want to take this one first. I'll start. It was quite interesting when I saw the question on my love for it. <laughs> I do I do love it. I do love that when we run our courses, when we work on KM, on knowledge management, um, I find it quite inspiring, really, because I find it touches when you think about it it touches, and we've talked about this, it touches all aspects of organizational life, whether you're an individual, whether you're you know, working on your own, whether you're working as part of a team, the way, the way people work together, the way all organizations really work. And so I find it really interesting. In fact, the more, yeah, the more I read about it, the more I find out about it, and the realization that actually the way I operate, the way I work in a working context, the way I relate to people, and I, I recognize myself in a lot of the um, 
elements when we talk about KM as well. So that's actually quite interesting because I recognize that things and behaviors, if you like, that I've been practicing um, are have a name. <laughs> so that's quite interesting. Yeah, so it's it's that really. And it's also because the it's um I find it really quite incredible that you can that a lot of the time people realize that they are doing knowledge sharing, they are doing KM. It's not something new. It's something that people are doing and it's just um, finding the terminology for it and the recognition, um, really. Mm. I had a very similar response. I'll, I'll, I'll continue if I may, because yeah, go ahead. the first thing that yeah, completely struck me was how, how, in, how expansive it is. It touches on an individual, an organization movement. Um, individually speaking, I think it's it's a call for us to be um, responsible, accountable. You know, we think about what can I share that's going to be helpful and, and easy for other people. So it, it kind of switches you on to what kind of knowledge is useful, but also how I can make requests and ask for knowledge <laughs> and seek it. So that supply and demand side operates at an individual level, which is which is really quite powerful, but it also operates through organizations and into movements of people. And I, I'm on that note, I think, really, I mean, without knowledge management being a kind of live concept or a discipline, many of the things we're experiencing now couldn't happen. Mm. And I, I want I didn't want to be too general talking about this. And the other day I was close to people working on ecocide, having having an international provision of law for the crime of ecocide. And it's an international movement now, inspired by the most amazing woman, Polly Higgins, who's now passed away, um, who galvanized knowledge around the world. And you know, connected barristers, lawyers, people just working on these things for years to en enable a kind of collective expression of what we know about ecocide now and what provision and teeth can be in place to prosecute per perpetrators essentially. And that is going to come about in the next three, four years. That's what, what the what's on the horizon. So I was imagining that across the world, harnessing this knowledge of different specialists you know facing one of the biggest threats of our time and actually on a grand scale that is knowledge sharing in practice it really is i think knowledge management is also very very practical you know we enjoy working with really concrete tools you know how do you review an event how do you share with peers how do you do it knowledge management gives us kind of language and tools around that and it also approaches the psychological side as well i think you were touching on it just What's the mindset? What's our attitude? How do we share? Are we are we working in silos? Are we collaborating? How do all of it? So I think although we didn't know we needed knowledge management 30 years ago, the fact that we've got it now really does enable us to coordinate better, I think, um, and use it as a, as a working discipline. So for all those reasons, I think it's I think it is really worthwhile um, in how we formulate and coordinate action together. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, the way forward, I think, is um, with knowledge sharing. And I think most of the biggest global challenges we can only tackle mm -hmm. with sharing knowledge. And in this knowledge management plays a very important role. Um, yeah, so my third question would be, um, what is the one thing that you're most grateful for? Um, it's quite similar, maybe to the first question, but um, Ruth, if you want to uh, answer this one. <laughs> Deceptively simple. I, I don't know how to answer this. I'm grateful for a great deal of things, very, very much, everything. Specifically, rivers. That's my short answer. Yeah. Rivers, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I'm grateful for, yeah, of course, I'm grateful for lots. And actually, I try and actually tell myself or remind myself of three things every day that I'm grateful for. It's actually a really good practice. Um, I'm trying to get my son to do that as well. But, <laughs> so, but um, the, then I was, what I was thinking was in the light of the news of yesterday and what's been going on around, in the world around us, I'm grateful for, in a way, the freedom to live the life as I want on a day-to-day -day basis. And, it, and just the realization that there are no restrictions in the way I want to live my life. 
and that the relationships I have, the social networks, the, where I work, where I can go, you know, in reality, the, the freedoms I have are immense. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for, for sharing these. Um, and my final question would be, um, so what are your hopes um, for the future? Or what do you hope the future holds, in other words? Um, Sylvia, if you... If you uh, well, to... actually, interestingly, I was thinking about that. And in relation to, in relation to what I'm grateful for, I would, in a way, I'd hope, I would love to hope that other people can sh have the same freedom that I have, you know, uh, around the world. That's a really big hope, you know, but that... That people, yeah, yeah, that people can have the freedoms that they're entitled to, really. Um, and so that's on a bigger level, and hoping that um, things do improve politically, economically, socially. That's really, you know, on a big macro level. Um, and on a really personal level, actually, coming out of two years of COVID, um, I'm actually um, look forward to and hope that in my life there are more challenges because I actually feel I learn that way. So yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yeah, Ruth, um, what would be your take on, on this question? At this very moment, I hope <laughs> my dog is gonna go away from the store. <laughs> I think he's interfering with our talk. However, I think on a much more, um, you know, I'm, yeah, with respect and consideration. My hope is that, we continue to wake up to a shift in consciousness and evolution. And I think it's gonna come with some pain and some tension. I think we're already seeing lots of that. Maybe throughout history it's been like that, but I think it's particularly acute at the moment. And my hope is, which implies it's a gap at the moment, but my hope is that we are awake. We become more and more awake to that possibility for evolution of consciousness and that will bring us different solutions then because we'll be being different than we are now so on a grand scale i still hold out hope for that yeah thank you so much for sharing thank you for both for sharing all of these um insightful and inspirational thoughts um actually um yeah thank you and thank you for everyone who has been watching and listening to us as well Thanks, Thanks Petra. Petra. Thank you.